Welcome back, everybody. This is Crashes and Taxes. I am not Rebecca, but I am Matt, the podcast producer. And uh, and you'll hear me occasionally on the podcast. So for longtime listeners, you're probably familiar with me already and know why I'm here, which is uh, every once in a while, Rebecca and I get the chance to just jump on and do these quick impromptu episodes where I get to pick her brain uh, and bring the goodness to you. So we're going to just do a short episode today about the stock market and just how much of it is smoke and mirrors. Because as we record this, I think, Rebecca, we're at 36,000 and change. It's been on kind of the steady incline up. And of course, um, pretty much everyone on the left and most of the people on the right point to that and go, hey, nothing to see here. Economy is doing great. Stock market's going up. Even Trump used to say that back when he was president. Everything is fine because the stock market's growing up. Uh, obviously, that's not true. And you know that the fundamentals are not that great. So what do people actually need to look for? And, uh, and how do we avoid getting caught up in that hype machine yeah that's a great question matt and let me just say everyone loved when you did the production with me the, the one time we did it last time because i can just ramble on and i can ask <laughs> not you know <laughs> so it's really great to have you uh really direct me and produce this the the episode so thank you so much for that you know the interesting thing about the stock market is i would say that that has a basis in reality it came from somewhere like we right. believe that the market is a good barometer for the economy because Traditionally, historically, it has been. Yes. I would say that things really started to change in 2008 and 2009. And mm. uh, specifically with the global recession, we call it in America, the Great Recession. The rest of the world calls it the GFC, the Global Financial Crisis. Okay. And the reason the rest of the world calls it the GFC is if you will remember back, I'll take back everyone to that time frame just for a moment. That's when um, we had the mortgage-backed securities that were being basically packaged as a bond, stamped by Standards and Poor's and Moody's as AAA credit grade, like this is great paper that you're buying. And it was mm -hmm. really so probably somewhere in the B range. And they were stamping as AAA. And it was basically a consolidated uh, mix of just mortgages that were resetting after two or five right. years. And so once the reset started to go in, that's when really things started to collapse. People couldn't continue to pay their mortgage payments. Mm -hmm. Defaults started happening, foreclosure started happening. And you saw all of the liquidity that had been pumped in really over a five year period of time to this new market, this BC paper collapsed the financial sector. And people think, mm -hmm. oh, well, Lehman Brothers, you know, went bankrupt. Uh, Merrill Lynch almost went bankrupt. Ba Bank of America came in and bailed them out. I mean, people forget that Merrill Lynch was literally at the brink of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because the bonds that were sold were, were basically defaulting and, and failing. It was the credit default swaps or the insurance contracts that were written against the default of those bonds that actually sunk yeah. AIG, Lehman Brothers. And uh, so it was the insurance side of the business that really started to collapse the financial sector. And that's when we had the government come in for the first time. I, that's not true. Uh, we had it happen with General Motors as well, where Obama basically and Bush decided to bail out General Motors. But mm -hmm. before General Motors, really, and, and that really was was sort of at, at the same time frame, so that wasn't really the best example. But um, but at the end of, end of the day, they decided that these banks were too big to fail. That's where the right. too big to fail came in. And we started to, to literally uh, do a TARP, a Troubled Asset Relief Program. And we started to do quantitative easing, which means that instead of going through, yeah, the pain <laughs> that we went through, we organically mm -hmm. went through our last full organic correction was 2001, 2002, and, and 2000. And uh, basically the dot-com crash. Everyone, yeah. everyone knows the dot-com crash. If you look at the S&P, 500, the dot-com crash error, you'll see that that took five years to fully recover those losses. It was wow. a three-year slide. We lost 49% over three years, and we organically recovered from that over five years. We got back to whole five years later. So mm. that's very painful, right? Mm. So when the too big to fail was happening and we started to have all these problems, um, the government said, well, we can't let these banks fail. We can't let GM fail. We're going to come in. We're going to prop up everything, cut interest rates back to basically nothing. And mm. then why did we do that? Why did we cut interest rates to nothing? Because we are going to start printing millions and trillions of trillions. And we don't want to be borrowing money at these high interest rates because we're going to yeah. be paying those rates. So we cut the interest rates and we started quantitative easing and we went from there. And so we really haven't had a terrible systemic demise of the market and then an organic recovery. We've had right. systemic demises, but we have not had organic recoveries since 2009 because we've decided that we know best 
and we can mm -hmm. stimulate our way out of everything. And this really comes down to MMT. You probably heard of yep. MMT, Modern Monetary Theory, which is a Keynesian uh, LSE, which is what I'm, I'm a part of the London School of Economics graduating this year. Um, but it's this Keynesian idea that we can stimulate our way out of any problem as, and there's no repercussions to that as long as we can service the debt. And mm -hmm. I think that what 2022 is going to be a place marker forever in the history of time, this will be a benchmark year that will always be discussed from now until forever the end. And that is because we are at the tipping point and are going to have a reality reset this right. year, 2022. We are mm -hmm. at the tipping point, Matt. And, and if you think about why we were already propping things up where we didn't even know the federal reserve has just released papers in the last 30 days that let us know information that was not publicly disseminated before for example okay. the largest bank bailout that has ever occurred to the tune of over three trillion dollars happened in 2019. now what <laughs> this, this is what i'm saying this okay. is information that is coming out now that has been not that has been withheld from the public and now we're finding out that banks were bailed out in 2019 to the tune of over three trillion dollars now we thought under trump the economy was extremely strong the fundamentals were there the chinese trade war all these things happening but you can't fake it forever you can't right. stimulate your way out of everything so what was happening was these banks needed to be re assured and refermented on the capital that they were holding and mm -hmm. lending out in 2019. So you had that happen in 2019, it's just come to light, just been publicly disseminated, which bothers me a lot because these are publicly traded banks and this should have mm -hmm. been public information from the beginning, but it right. wasn't. Right. And so now you have a situation where you're in 2022 at the very beginning and you have a situation where the world wide has created $25 trillion of currency in the last 20 months. The United States Good has God. created about 8 trillion between the CARES Act, the HEROES Act, the a uh, AFP Act, and then the Federal Reserve, which they're right now, before they're tapering, they're doing 120 billion of quantitative easing purchasing per month. We're doing 40 billion in mortgage-backed securities, which are the same things that were sold and packaged on Wall Street in 2009, and they're right. doing 80 billion of treasuries. And that's what we're starting to talk about tapering. So what's happening now, and I know I'm going on a tangent over here, but we're just at a tipping point on the market. And so Good. we have been, like I said, we have not had a true organic correction since the, since the dot-com crash 20 right. years ago. Yep. We haven't had, we have not allowed the market to just re reap what it has sown. Right. And, and, and so that has meant that we have had to fake it through the stimulus of federal dollars being put out into the economy. And the reason that the market has done so phenomenally well, it's a combination of reasons, but to say it in a nutshell, you used to have gold, you used to have outside commodities, you used to have these things that people believed in, but mm -hmm. gold is going through a phenomenon this year because of cryptocurrency. People right. are more, they're, instead of going into gold, people are going into the blockchain crypto side. Yep. And which I'm not a, not not a for. I, I own Bitcoin in all disclosure, and I'm a fan of crypto. But mm -hmm. what I'm not a fan of is thinking it's a gold replacement because it's mm. not. Because crypto has, as far as the United States goes, the United States has decided and has ruled, the IRS specifically I'm talking about, has ruled that cryptocurrency is an investment. This is the current ruling. But I have been telling people for years, the second that it is used as a currency, like with Amazon accepting it as a currency to check out and other PayPal and other things coming online to say, we will accept your Bitcoin. The second that it is used on a somewhat massive basis as a currency, the government is going to get involved as fast as you can say bananas. And the reason for that is the central banks of the world, which have just printed $25 trillion of new global currency, have no ability to do anything if they don't control the money supply. And so if you start to have <laughs> yeah. a decentralized 
currency that is used as a currency, you will see so fast regulation. That's why the SEC is in a big fight right now to start to get a handle and regulate. Where mm -hmm. is the SEC, Security and Exchange Commission, where are they in regulating blockchain crypto? But yet you're seeing this push now because they can't allow it to happen, Matt. They yeah. cannot allow a decentralized currency. So you, what you have right now in 2022 is finally all points coming together. It's a tipping point. It is the tipping point that the central bankers are ready for. And this is what the global reset, the great reset is with the World Economic Forum. The great reset mm -hmm. in a nutshell was the design plan to leverage some kind of global economic collapse, whether it's a global pandemic, Mm -hmm. a global economic collapse, a mm -hmm. some kind of global event that has such size and magnitude that it makes the people of the world say, our national governments are no longer getting the job done. And what we need is a world sovereign power that will sort yeah. of set the tone. And you've already seen this happen through Corona. If you've noticed, we've had the World Health Organization, we've had the World Economic mm -hmm. Forum, we've had these global entities that are spouting health policy, economic policy, how we get through this thing. And I think that the globalists really wanted for the Great Reset, and they say this, this is nothing that you can go out and see Agenda 2030 and read all of these things yourself but mm -hmm. their their vision was a global situation that would bring about the necessis, necessar, necessary conditions that people would be really ready to say you know the national sovereignty is a control. myth and we need yeah. global control and uh, it's not working out the way that they had thought or no. planned it's, no, it's not, not going that, that way at all but now they're backed into a corner because they've printed so much money and the reason the market has done so well is when mm. you're at, looking at crypto you're looking at gold and you're looking at equities when you have no place else to put your money, there's no bonds to buy. If you right. want any kind of legitimate return, since 2009, interest rates have been next to zero. Mm -hmm. We have not normalized interest rates at this point. So people mm -hmm. will not buy bonds. In fact, we finally have Wall Street admitting in the last uh, 90 days that bonds are really not a long-term investment prospect as they've always been. They've always been the yin yeah. to the yang of equities. And the Wall Street has been in these last 90 days that that is no longer have holding true. And this is why all of the money has been captured in the market because where else uh, can it go, Matt? Where else right. can it go? It doesn't make any sense that on the heels of a global pandemic that the world hasn't seen for a hundred years or longer, that the equity markets would be going nothing but up. But they are and they have been. And you have to ask yourself, where are the economic fundamentals to support it? With 12 million job openings, we had the clips of 4 million people per month leaving their jobs in October, November, mm -hmm. and December of last year, 2021. We call it the great exodus of the worker. It's outrageous. It's insane. And so all these people are quitting, but yet they're still living. They're still meeting their bills. They're how is this happening? Is it because right. the moratoriums on evictions and foreclosures? Is it because there's no student loan payments due? Is it because they're getting money for every child they have if they make under a certain amount of money as a married couple or as a single person? All yeah. of these things are fundamentally changing the economy in America as we know it and globally. And this is why you see the irrationality of the market going up and up and up. And it's very hard for me because, you know, I go every week, three plus times a week, I'm on a national news mm -hmm. channel talking about this market. And everyone has just got these glazed eyes of like, you know, just say what you, you know, the market's good and everything is fine and everything's right. great. And I'm looking around at these people and saying like, what? what are these where are these people reading these this data from and then you get the the federal reserve releasing documents and you know and you realize my god it's just not at all what we really think behind the scenes where you no. can see what's really going on and you peel back that curtain and um and that's the problem yeah that was really really good holy cow okay i'm excited for we're going to do another episode because i want to dig into some of the specific trends that you see coming in 2022 and what the tipping point will be uh but yeah i mean i i i completely agree all the things that you just mentioned are things that i've been keeping an eye on too and i think if you know people that believe some of the same things have been looking at those uh those underlying indicators and i will never ever 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 understand the mentality of stop looking 
Like don't, don't look one layer deeper. Just focus on the top line metric. That's nothing to see here. This is all you need. Um, and it seems like, like you pointed out, that's who they let on national television. So you get the Jim Cramers of the world <laughs> yelling about how everyone should be forced to be vaccinated. And, uh, that's the only solution that stocks are going to go up forever. And, ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so you get a bunch of TV talking heads that really don't, it's not that they don't know what they're talking about. And that's what's so hard for people to understand is these are smart people. It is a specific kind of willful ignorance that it's almost like they believe that if we just keep the game going for long enough, that we can change reality. Yeah, it's a it's a very weird thing. Yeah, and, so, I, and let me just yeah. defend them for just one second, Matt, because they they honestly believe that the Federal Reserve and the central banks of the world will be able to keep this going. They are true Keynesian believers of MMT. They believe yeah, that it doesn't point. matter if our debt is thirty trillion or three hundred trillion, as long as we have the tax base to sustain the interest or service the debt, then then mm -hmm. we're fine. But I feel. And, and, and really an economic paper, and there will be many that will come, trust me, but an economic paper will really do us a lot of service to really put MMT to bed. Because when you have 7% year over year inflation, because you printed $8 trillion in the last 20 months in your country, and you realize, geez, you know, this is not actually working as they said. They said there'd be no impact. And now people are real wage dollar growth is is negative because yeah. yes, we, we got almost a, a 4.56% annual increase in income last year, but we got a 7% increase in prices. So you actually real wage growth went down. It's negative almost two yeah. plus percent, two and a half percent. And so that is where people are starting to really feel it. And then of course you've got the supply chain problems. But again, a lot of this mat is contrived. A lot of this, of course, China is having their problems. They do have a property collapse. They're trying to keep that as quiet and close to the belt mm. as possible. Now, Evergrande, as I mentioned to you the last time, they are in full-on liquidation bankruptcy. The second largest property manager in China behind Evergrande is also mm. in liquidation bankruptcy. China's wow. doing its best to keep all of that sort of self-contained, but mm -hmm. then the Omicron has basically made them you know, close manufacturing again. So the, the ship sort of sitting off of the coast of California, that's a real thing that's really happening. There's really empty shelves. We have that happening, but then we also have the Omicron that is also going to cause additional supply chain issues with China. And then you have mm -hmm. Biden's uh, vaccine mandate going into effect for the truckers that go between Canada and the United States. And that is going into effect very soon here. And that is going to be the biggest shock to the supply chain that we have seen yet. Because really? we are, Canada is our largest trading partner in domestic goods. And they bring so much into our country that you will see empty shelves like you have not expected to see or would wouldn't even be able to imagine could possibly happen in the United States of America. And it's somewhat self imposed, because yeah. when you mandate vaccines internationally, which of course, the Biden administration doesn't even have the constitutional authority to do it here as we are, you know, it's interesting, I listened to the Supreme Court arguments um, on January the 7th about the vaccine mandates. And I listened to Justice Sotomayor make yeah. the, the statement, which was appallingly shocking to most free people when she asked the question that why couldn't the administration uh, mandate and treat us like machines? Like if, no. if, the OSHA, if OSHA has the authority to mandate that machines are doing a certain thing to keep people safe, why can't we do the same thing to humans. And of course, it's such a basic question that it was repulsive to me. I'm like, we are human beings with rights derived from God, yeah. not from government. If our rights come from the government, then I can take be taken away from the government. If our rights come because we are an eight living being born into freedom as we are in this United States of America, then we have sovereign rights that you, the government cannot take away unless we do something to dis, do, to rip ourselves right. away from our rights. If we commit right. a crime and we Perfect. are subjecting ourselves to our own jail because of what we did. But yeah. vaccine mandates are not included in that list. So, you know, it's just a very unusual time at, and all of this is coming now finally to a reckoning point that we will see in 2022. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, let's finish with this because I know we want to get another episode recorded. Uh, what's the best way to reach out and connect, especially if somebody wants to work with you? I think that this is going to be a tremendously big year because we are one of the only practices that does have a national you know, footprint and yet does have the truth. It's still 
uh, is that we still find a way to seep the truth out there as much as we can. And you know, I don't want to to say that the people that are expecting the market to keep going, they, these people aren't wrong in the sense that they just believe that it will work and that we can just keep stimulating. And it's just a wrong economic philosophy, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, but it is a valid economic philosophy. I just believe that we have pretty much now i think put the nail in the coffin of mmt because seven percent year over year inflation the worst inflation in 40 years four mm -hmm. decades we really can't argue about this anymore so when things really get difficult this year and you're turning on the television and the, the prognosticators are still saying that the sky is not falling and everything's going to be okay uh one you're not prepared because you haven't done anything to prepare because you haven't believed that something was coming and you'll be looking for a practice and advisors that um are a lot more with their head to the ground with their boots on the ground knowing the true data and what's really happening and we're preparing our clients for this in and this inevitability that is coming mm -hmm. and so uh the best way to reach out is to just go to walterwealth.com or call our phone number that's right on that and they'll connect to our team and they'll get right in with us. Perfect. I love it. And everybody should go do that immediately as well as get your book uh, and just get get uh really steeped in what your belief system is and see if they agree because if they resonate with the things that we're saying then it's better to work with a wealth advisor and a financial advisor that actually agrees with you uh, and and believes that the same things uh, are going to happen and are coming down the pipe because if they don't believe you, they're not going to help you prepare the way that you would like to be prepared. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, but this it. is a choice. You can you can choose to mm -hmm. believe and ride the ride it out and see where it takes you, or you can choose to say, you know, maybe I should go a little cautious. And you know, the the worst thing that I can do to my clients is be wrong and they miss out on a couple of months of growth or they miss out on you right. know. So, but it's all you know, all say, fake growth, anyways. But then if I'm right and people don't take the advice, right, that we're talking about, you know, the the mm -hmm. inevitable potentially uh, collapse of massive retirement savings. And we already have a yeah. huge wealth gap in this country. We, we already are so underprepared as an average citizen for retirement on our own individual basis anyways, that we just mm -hmm. can't afford, Matt, to have this market really tank and have people's retirement accounts just decimated. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, we can. Yeah, that would be a very terrible outcome. So let's do everything we can to avoid that. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. We really appreciate it. Go check out the website, walsterwealth.com, and, uh, and just check out the next episode. We're going to talk about what else we see coming in the year 2022.